Atkins. I am uh, the faculty director of Transformative Ideas. Uh, how many of you are involved in inform uh, Transformative Ideas in a class or an event? Okay, good, well, welcome. Uh, Transformative Ideas is a sophomore program uh, here at Duke, and what we try to do is expose uh, students, invite students to uh, seek uh, the truth and inquire into uh, life's biggest questions of meaning and, and value and, and flourishing. Uh, and we like to encourage conversations across different, uh, different perspectives. And, uh, and so anyway, so we, we welcome you all here. And part of uh, Transformative Ideas is we have a living learning community uh, in LLC. Uh, and uh, the LLC has organized uh, this event tonight, uh, this event on Islam and modernity. And, and a couple of people have asked me in the last couple of days, does this event have anything to do with the current sort of conflict in the Middle East? And, and, and my answer is no, uh, not in any kind of immediate sense. Uh, this is something that we, uh, we planned uh, well in advance. And, and of course, the other thing uh, to understand is uh, that, uh, you know, that Islam is the second largest religion in the world today behind Christianity. And by 2050, uh, Pew uh, anticipates that Islam and Christianity uh, will be equally large uh, uh, as the two most populous religions across the world. So, so Islam is a, is a global uh, religion. And, and as my friend Abdullah and Tepli uh, likes to point out, uh, for those of you who are in the good life class, uh, that the, the largest uh, population of, of Muslims is actually not a Middle Eastern country, but, but Indonesia. Uh, and so, like other non-Western religions, such as Hinduism, Islam has had a complex and, and I think sometimes challenging relationship with Western liberalism. And so this conversation tonight that's going to be moderated by uh, Jason Murray, who is the president. Let's hear it for Jason, who is the president, one of the co-presidents of our LLC. Uh, is going to offer us a chance to reflect on Western liberalism. What is that? And, and also on Islam uh, in uh, their various complexities uh, and histories. Uh, so joining us and joining Jason uh, on uh, the uh, front of the room is uh, our two wonderful and eminently qualified professors here at Duke uh, to speak on these issues. Uh, we'll start first right here at my immediate right is uh, Michael Gillespie. Michael is uh, the professor of political science and professor of philosophy. He's the author of Hegel, Heidegger, and the Ground of History, Nihilism Before Nietzsche, nice alliteration, uh, The Theological Origins of Modernity, and Nietzsche's Final Teaching. He is also the co-editor of uh, Nietzsche's New Seas, Explorations in Philosophy, Aesthetics, and Politics, as well as Ratifying the Constitution, and Homo Politicus, Homo Economicus. Michael has published articles on Montaigne, Kant, Hegel, Nietzsche, Heidegger, Existentialism, and various topics in American political thought in public philosophy, as well as on the relationship between religion and politics. Uh, he is currently completing a sequel to The Theological Origins of Modernity, entitled The Theological Faith of Modernity. He is the director of the Duke Program in American Values and Institutions and the Visions of Freedom Focus Program. Uh, welcome, Michael. Thank you. Uh, our other uh, esteemed uh, distinguished panelist is uh, Mohsen Kadavar. Uh, professor Kadavar is research professor of Islamic studies. His work is at the intersection of Islamic studies, the contemporary history of thought in the Middle East, and the philosophy of religion. Uh, his teachings and research cover comparative medieval philosophy, Islam and politics, modernity, human rights, and the meaning of life. Uh, Kadavar is known for his work in advocating for the compatibility of modernity with reformist Islam. His books, Blasphemy and Apostasy in Islam, as well as Human Rights in Reformist Islam, both published by Edinburgh uh, in 2021, productive year for you, uh, as uh, reflect his arguments in this regard. He has uh, authored numerous books and scholarly articles in Persian, uh, with some of his works translated into seven different languages. His forthcoming books are entitled Governance by Guardianship from Cambridge and The Illusion of Islamic Theocracy by a press which will remain <coughs> nameless, uh, no, by UNC's press. 
Uh, they, they have a good press, just not so good in basketball. Uh, well, as you can see, we have two wonderful speakers uh, before us, very eminent scholars who uh, we're so grateful to have given up their evening to come and have this conversation. Uh, so join me in uh, welcoming Professor uh, uh, Kadavar and Professor Gillespie. And now I will turn it over to our moderator. Thank you so much, Dr. Atkins. And thank you for everyone here sitting in the audience, uh, you know, being willing participants in this conversation about Islam and modernity. So in 2017, I just want to start there. In 2017, Trump's Muslim ban effectively prohibited several Muslim-majority countries um, from even entering the U.S. on the grounds to defend itself from terrorism. And in 2021, former president, former um, French presidential candidate, Eric Zemmour, called, has called on French Muslims uh, to assimilate and to renounce the practice of the religion that, quote, impose a legal and political code on them. While we can see rightfully this as blanket Islamophobia and xenophobia, it could also speak to something deeper to the American and Western European psyche, which is liberalism, and Western liberalism in particular. Major liberal thinkers such as John Locke and John Rawls have, just, have suggested um, that there is a conflict between liberal protection of individual rights and separation of church and state in the West and the Islamic emphasis on family, community, and Allah. But this wasn't always the case. And so we turn now to Dr. Gillespie. In your book on the theological origins of modernity, there seems to be unity between um, the Islamic world and the Western world uh, of such thinkers such as Averroes and Aquinas drawing both on Aristotle. And Dr. Gillespie, can you please take a few minutes uh, to talk about how the Western world could diverge from this unity in trajectory of Western philosophy and in theology. <clears throat> well, first of all, thank you for having us uh, both here. Uh, it, you know, it, it couldn't come in a more needful time, uh, it seems to me. Uh, the thinking that's swirling about Islam is, is especially pernicious at this time, it seems to me. Uh, and it, it fails to understand, especially among Christians and Jews, it fails to understand the connection between the three great Abrahamic religions. Uh, and it, <clears throat> it's nowhere so clear as in the question that you just raised, which is, um, what, what, ha why, what, what is the relationship between Islam and, and, and Christianity? Uh, and certainly, I, I think there's no doubt that the intellectual uh, impact was uh, of, of Islam upon Christianity, right? Uh, Aquinas and all of the, uh, the people that we think of as medieval rationalists were really um, <clears throat> drawing very heavily upon uh, the thought of Islam. And the, uh, the, the and I'm gonna probably mispronounce it, but the Mutzalite thinkers, uh, Avicenna, uh, Avoris, uh, and, and others, Played, played a big role in influencing those thinkers to, to, to go back to Aristotle, go back to Plato, and to try to understand the way in which we could understand God as a rational being of, of one kind or another. <clears throat> also, the, the later development in which there was a rejection of medieval thought in Christianity also followed a rejection of similar thought in in, in Islam with the rise of Asherite thinking, which focused not so much on God's rationality, but upon God's omnipotence, upon God's power. And <clears throat> in that sense, both traditions, I think, moved into a very problematic area because one of the problems that Christianity had and that I think is reflected as well in Islam is the question of, of the role of divine will versus divine reason, which is primary. D to put it another way, is, it does, does God, is God rational because he made the rules of rationality? Or did God look at something and say, well, this is rational that, I, that we need to live in that way? Another way to put it was, if God is simply, uh, and makes up all the rules, well, then he must be, in a certain sense, the source not just of good, but of evil. And so divine greatness, in that sense, if it's understood in terms of divine power, uh, means that, we have, that God is responsible for everything. Right? Uh, if God is rational and uh, 
granted human beings freedom uh, to, to exercise their rationality or not, as the case may be, then uh, he, we, we have, as Augustine pointed out, we have someone else to blame for evil, i.e. us. <laughs> that we, 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 we're disobedient, we're prideful, we, 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 we disobey. And so I think that um, the, the trajectory of both traditions uh, really uh, w was, was rooted in the initial trajectory that, uh, that I I Islamic thought followed. Uh, one of the things, one of the differences I think arises in with the rejection in early modernity beginning with the Reformation, uh, but even earlier than that with um, the nominalist thinkers of the kind of rationality that um, was typical in um, the, the people like Aquinas and, and, and other scholastics, and the notion that every, every being is created, every every being is radically individualized, which is to say God doesn't create species like human beings. He doesn't create trees, he creates individual beings and then it's only the weakness of our intellect that causes us to rely upon general categories. And in relying on those general categories, we, um, we go astray in terms of attributing to all human beings, for example, rationality. So Locke, for example, says at one point, um, <clears throat> there may be people that look like human beings, but if they don't obey the moral law, they're really just like tigers and lions, right? And they can be treated like wild beasts and should be treated like wild beasts, right? Um, <clears throat> the, the development that followed from that was the, dis the discovery of a new vision of what the laws of nature were, not just that the world was divided into species so that we could say, for example, with syllogistic reasoning, uh, <clears throat> all men are animals, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is an animal, right? That we, we've got these universal categories, we can connect them together and we know something as a result of that. If there aren't any, of, if those categories are all just conventions that we use and that are imperfect in their own way, then it's really crucial for us to to, to understand, to, to ask ourselves whether God, whether there is any order in, in the universe at all. And in the Western Christian tradition, that was the source of modern natural science. The notion that the laws of nature are not the way the world is divided up into categories, but really the way in which things move in the world. And that was identified initially with God's will, right? that we don't understand God's body, not the, the, or God, God's creation, the bodies of things he created, but the way he put things in motion. So that uh, eventually we can see a kind of rationality in that that characterizes, that comes to characterize modern science. And I know, since most of you are probably not math majors, that uh, <clears throat> this leads to what we think of as the language of modernity, which is calculus, right? Which can measure and measure motion and can show that the world is understandable uh, <clears throat> mathematically, the motion of the world. And that was something that for Aristotle and Aquinas was simply a category error. It was a mistake to think that we could measure motion uh, mathematically. It began with Galileo, it was uh, increased by Descartes. Uh, with his Cartesian coordinate system, as some of you are familiar with, and then it became calculus with Newton and Leibniz, which enabled us to, to measure the way all kinds of things change, and it's used in the social sciences, it's used in the natural sciences, and uh, it allows us to do a whole lot of things that we, we didn't do before, but it's rooted in a, a different understanding of what God's law is, rooted in a notion of divine will. Anyway, I'll stop there. Yeah. Wow. Thank, thank you for that summary. And two things really stick out to me just from listening. One is about calculus in particular and just math in general. We're talking about algebra, obviously, just from that word itself coming from uh, and has origins in that Islamic society, particularly in the Islamic golden age. But also the fact that you that you mentioned that there are 
is might be a parallelism to nominalism in the Islamic tradition, focusing on God's will supremely over maybe God's rationality. And so I'm wondering, opening, opening up to the floor to both of you, I guess, why do you think that um, Islam, the Islamic um, civilization, really didn't go down that same trajectory as uh, the West? Do you think that's because of maybe the, the Reformation and like there's some technical reasons for that with the printing press, or do you think that just, I don't know, that, that's something that I'm curious about as well. So. We, um, either one of you can answer, but um, that will be something, yeah. Okay, first of all, I thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful event. Uh, may I continue what Professor Galapsi said mm -hmm. and uh, talk a few words yeah. on the Islamic side of what he said. Uh, you compared uh, Thomas Aquinas on Christian side with Al Ghazali from Islamic side. And what you said maybe about Ghazali was correct. But maybe if we want to compare fairly with both sides, we, it's better to choose a philosopher from Islamic side too, the same as Thomas Aquinas, not some, someone like Al Ghazali that was more a theologian. Mm -hmm. and mystic. So, in uh, Islamic side, we have Al-Farabi, we have Ibn Sina or Ali Sina, and we have Averus or Ibn Rushd, that also Al-Ghazali, that all of their works were translated from Arabic to Latin in around 12th century. And Thomas Aquinas and other uh, Christian theologians and philosophers read their books and were under deep influence of these four Muslim philosophers, not only Christian uh, uh, theologian and philosopher like Aquinas, but also Maimonides, mm -hmm. or in Arabic term, Ibn Maimon. So uh, the most distinguished Jewish philosopher and theologian. So most of the works of Thomas and also Maimonides were under influence of first Ibn Sina, Avicenna, and second Arabs. It means that if we do not know philosophy of Avicenna or Averus or Al Farabi, we cannot understand correctly philosophy of Thomas Aquinas or Maimonides. So this is first and a second among Muslims. As Professor said correctly, we have someone like nominalist in Christian um, and also some divine voluntarist that someone like Al Ghazali that believe in absolute freedom for God and okay, there is a very short room for freedom of human being, freedom of human will, but among Muslims that we have big philosophers like Ibn Sina or Al-Farabi or Averus, that they believed in free will for human beings and also in Mu'tazilite. Mu'tazilite were theologians, not philosophers, counterpart of Ash'arite, the theologians, that they believed and they supported strongly human free will. So much more, several, I think, centuries before what we learn, for example, from Immanuel Kant. We have uh, ethical subject, ethical objectivism among Muslim, especially Mu'tazilite in ethics, that exactly the same point Immanuel Kant mm -hmm. said. I do not know that Kant read Mu'tazilite or not, but if we want to have comparative philosophy between Islamic and Christian, or Eastern and Western philosophy, it's so good that most of these issues started not by Aristotle, but started by some of these uh, philosophers that I mentioned. And maybe it's so good that also Professor wrote in his book too, I read it and it's so interesting and I advise you to read his book. He mentioned that we had a group of philosophers and theologians among Christians in medieval age that they were called Averosist, European Averosist. It means follower of Averos. 
And I think that the only it's not his job discovering Aristotle for the Christians and Western, because it's so interesting that uh, Aristotle was translated from Greek to Arabic, and after that from Arabic to Latin. And European learned Aristotle in the medieval age through commentaries of Averroes, Al-Farabi, Ibn Sina, on Aristotle, translated from Arabic to Latin. And it was a question, why didn't they read the original, it's in original language. I think because they have some good commentary by Muslim uh, philosophers like Averroes that it make them so easier to understand the philosophy of Aristotle. And something that in the medieval age they learned from Averroes and not from Aristotle. This is exactly from Al-Farabi, from Al-Kindi, from Ibn Sira and the others. Consistency between revelation and reason. I say this is because both of Christian and Muslim philosophers were in tradition of Abrahamic traditions. They believe in revelation. Aristotle did not believe. Because of it, for the first time, they found, okay, it's possible to be a believer, to be a monotheist, and also to be a rationalist. This is something that we learn from the Farabi, we learn from Ibn Sina, we learn from Averroes, and after that, we learn from Thomas Aquinas and many big, good uh, Christian philosophers. I think this is a bridge between Islam and Christianity in medieval age, much more than what we read in the history of philosophy in English. And this is my first part. Do I have time to uh, yeah, answer yep. to your yes, question? Well, yes. So, you ask me, may you yeah, me basically, basically it's like, so Dr. Gillespie um, articulated kind of the outline of how both Christianity and Aristotle kind of merged, but then kind of got a divorce in a, in a lot of ways between kind of reactions um, by the nominalists in particular of divorcing God's rationality uh, and creation uh, rather than focusing very strongly on God's will as in like God will create these rational categories not because they're rational but because you know just God says so right and so that kind of breaks apart um, and leads into individualism so I guess the question is like since Islam was also operating on this Aristotle and Averroesian framework, how does how did Islam kind of maneuver out of that kind of um, trajectory that, that the West took? It's, this is a big question. So I think this is divergence and unity of Christianity and philosophy, or Islam and philosophy. It does not have only philosophical or theological reason. It has more socio-economic and political cause. I use cause here, not reason. There is difference between cause and reason. So sometimes we try to find what is the relationship between, for example, Islam and violence, between Christianity and peace. I think this is not a correct question. It has more political causes. In which situation, in which political, economic, cultural situation we are talking? I think the reason of this question also, your question, is more political, less theological or philosophical. It means that what happened politically, economically, culturally <clears throat> on those situations, especially in the time of, for example, Crusade Wars, in the time of colonialism. If I want to emphasize only on theological or philosophical reason, all of these, those who colonized were Christians. Is it correct to say there is a link between colonialism and Christianity, I say no. There is another issue. Or 
in several, we have some centuries in the name of golden age of science and philosophy among Muslims. Most of the sciences were improved by the Muslims. You know, chemistry, alchemy, Arabic term. Algebra, which you mentioned, Arabic term, Khwarazmi. A logarithm that we have is from Khwarazmi, very great Muslim mathematician. But what happened on that time, what happened for Muslims that they have something like US today, they were superpower in science, in culture, in civilizations. After that, we have declined. We have something else. What happened to, to this? This is, if we want to talk about it, it's more sociology, history, not theology or philosophy. Those who tried, for example, what happened in September 11? Do we have theological or philosophical answer to this question? I say no. This is more political, sociological answer to this. So because of it, I think if we distinguish these two types of study, it means that theological reason or philosophical reason with a political cause. I think most of these issues have political causes. And we should, this is the job of others, not the job of, for example, philosophers or theologians to talk about these issues. So if we want to talk about what happened to Muslims, I remember Ernest Renan in 18th century started in Sorbonne, in Paris, that us said something that Muslims do not have enough brain for science. After that, Jamaluddin al Afghani went to the same university, make a debate with him. What do you say? If we did not have brain, what are these sciences that we made for several centuries? I think in some centuries we are above the others, in some centuries others are above the Muslims. And this is not for theological or for philosophical reason. It's for social, political, economic uh, uh, causes that we should talk and discuss more about it. If you ask me what happened, it takes several hours to say what happened in these golden age and what happened in the time of colonialism that Muslims are in this situation that we are. Sorry, that yeah, no, thank, thank you for that thorough answer. And yeah, just turning it back to you, uh, Dr. Gillespie, just I guess any of your comments or thoughts on, I guess the distinction between theological and philosophical talk and political thought and economic thought and like and how they directly influence people. Because there seems, obviously we know that there's a correlation, but how much of a causal relationship do we want to make in this context or kind of see them as maybe independent or correlated? There's, there's, there's a lot of ways that we can kind of uh, nuance this in particular. Uh, look, look I, I, I agree uh, <clears throat> with Professor Kadavar in, in, in this respect. That there's no single cause to anything, right? I mean, politics matter, economics matter, uh, the structures of our societies matter, the character of Sharia law. My, my colleague, Timur Karan, wrote a book arguing that economic development was more difficult in Islamic countries because of Sharia law of inheritance. So there, there are lots of things that play a role in all of this. There's no doubt that the Crusades played a, a huge role in the relationship between, between Christianity and Islam. And the Crusades were driven principally by the conflict between the Catholic Church and the various kings, right? The, 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 the Pope was trying to send some of those some of those knights somewhere else so they, wouldn't, so they wouldn't cause trouble in their own countries and for him. So, you know, that, that was the beginning of the Crusades and, you know, it took on a theological, there was a theological penumbra around it, but, uh, you know, it, it clearly had a, 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 a political reason in, in the middle of it. Um, I think one of, the, one of the things that's probably certainly wasn't apparent to me when I was your age and took me a long time to figure out, is the world for the Middle Ages 
and, well, for the Roman world and for the Middle Ages, centered on the Mediterranean. Right? It was who, everything passed through the Mediterranean. So that if you wanted to, if you wanted to obtain spices, for example, they, they were going to come from, from the West, they were gonna move through the Islamic world, they were gonna then pass through Italy and move into Northern Europe. But it, you know, there, was a, there, were, there were trading relationships that took place there. One of the huge changes of, you know, we think of, uh, of 1492 as a really, what, 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 what's important about 1492? What's the most important event in 1492? Columbus's expedition to the, the New yes. World. Okay, you all agree? <laughs> Professor Kadavar would bet doesn't agree, right? And I don't agree. Probably the most important thing that happened in 1492 was the expulsion of the Jews and the Muslims from Spain, right? <clears throat> uh, and that led to all kinds of all kinds of changes, both in the, the rest of Christianity and then 1492, because it made, it made the world not center around the Mediterranean anymore, but around the Atlantic, right? And that was a huge change, right? And, and it, it led to uh, a change in economic well-being for all of those people that were dependent upon trade, because once you could sail around Africa and obtain spices and other things in the East, you no longer needed to ship them overland through the, through the Islamic world. So there were, there was that, then there was the uh, development of modern military force, and, and, the, and along with that came colonialism, right? First Dutch colonialism in the Far East, and British colonialism, and then uh, <clears throat> colonialism in the, in the Middle East as well. So, it's, so the experience of, of Western modernity for lots of the Islamic world was, was one of a, you know, a kind of horrible conquest by uh, you know, people that we, you know, we, 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 in a certain sense, taught how to be, taught how to be intellectuals. So it's, um, it's, so there, I think in any, when you're trying to explain anything, you have to look at lots of different causes, right? I do think that there are some, I would say theological, but also anthropological differences in thinking about the differences between Christian, Christianity and Islam and Judaism. And one of them is the notion that, that the Christian God was also human, right? And that humans are created in the image of God. And that opens up certain possibilities that aren't necessarily available in, in uh, Judaism or in Islam, right? Now, how important that is, it varies from place to place and time to time. But, you know, we today, we think of our, I mean, this is a late, one of your later questions, yeah, but yeah, we, think yeah, of, we, think. we think of the modern world as a secular world. You know, part of my, the impetus of my work has been to show that we're not nearly as secular as we think we are. That we, we you know, we have inherited all kinds of things from Christianity that we, have, we now attribute to ourselves, but that really don't have any particular foundation. So, you know, the, you mentioned uh, <clears throat> Rawls. I would, I would say Rawls and not Locke. Okay. Rawls was my former, one of my former teachers. Uh, but they were convinced that, you, that, that we couldn't trust people in the public space to make political decisions who were deeply influenced by scripture, right? And the argument there was that they, they, they can't make rationally demonstrable arguments that other people can understand. Well. But, uh, you know, he and lots of his, his, his fellow travelers certainly believe in things like rights. And, but there really isn't a very good, there really isn't a very good natural demonstration of rights. I mean, the truth of the, do any of you know what the Red, well, you who are in my class know what the Red Queen hypothesis was. The Red Queen, how many of you have read Alice in Wonderland? Any, okay. Remember in Alice in Wonderland, Alice gets to, she, she comes to the land of the Red Queen, and she said, what is the rule that governs here? And the Red Queen says, you have to run as fast as you can to stay where you are, right? And that's effectively the rule for, the biological rule for species, right? Species have to run as fast as they can to stay where they are, and they almost never succeed, right? 
they all slow down, they all, and they're all surpassed. So all, all species go extinct over time. Which means that, you know, the, the, you could put it in political terms and say, the real law of nature is the strong do what they will and the weak do what they must. Right? My own view is that, that one of the cru crucial things to understand is, that in our world in any case, uh, countries that believe in things like rights are way stronger than countries that don't, right? Because people support those regimes. It's a, it's a way in which the species can work together. But, but, you know, but it's, uh, you know, from my point of view, I don't think that Rawls's argument or Amy Gutman's argument, who's the other person that defends that position, is really very convincing because we all have things that we believe that aren't rationally demonstrable, right? And, uh, you know, so it's important to see that, you, you know, there isn't a radical separation between what we think of as theology and science and theology and, and political science and political life. Uh, those, those things are all intertwined, I think, all the time. And part of the problem is how do we, we conceal that from ourselves to, to in many instances. Yes, very much so. And, and that is a excellent kind of segue into our next kind of bringing this high philosophy and theology down into the political and then more into the, the individual. And so in, in particular for rights and for secular society, so in your book, Dr. Gillespie, um, you observed that modernity did not erase God so much so as it transfers attributes, powers, and capacities into other entities, realms, and beings. So does this mean that there is p any purely neutral secular space, even purportedly secular institutions carry with them theological um, you know, perspectives like anthropology, for example, people have rights and everything. So I guess opening up the floor to both of you, but particularly first Dr. Gillespie and then you can respond Dr. Kadavar of how, uh, you've already elucidated this a little bit of how this kind of relationship um, is, is manifested in our society and other societies around the world? Well, I mean, we certainly, we certainly have taken on lots of attributes that previously we were given to, to God, right? I mean, we, we imagine that we can make ourselves masters and possessors of nature, that we can, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the Old Testament, Job complains at one point to God and says, uh, you know, I don't deserve any of this. And, and God says, where were you when I, made the, when I made the found, laid the foundations of the world? And, you know, Job doesn't really have an answer to that. And then, but God then goes on to talk about all these things that you don't know. You don't know where the birds fly and the sound, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we know lots of those things now, right? But does that make us masters and possessors of nature in the same way to, with God-like powers? I mean, you don't have to watch many science fiction movies or read many science fiction books to find out that people actually imagine that we're going to terraform Mars and turn it into a livable planet, right? <clears throat> um, you know, and, and I think in that sense, we, we, have, we, we believe that we can do these kinds of things. That, was, that used to be called sin because it was, pr it was prideful and we compared ourselves to, God's, to God and that was what, you know, Satan was punished for. So, you know, it's... Um, you know, it, we, I, I just think we, we have taken on lots of, we imagine all kinds of things that are within our power that previously were not. And we have much greater power than we used to. It's just whether we have the ability to really understand the whole seems to me to be, you know, wrong headed. So, it, so just to kind of recap, this is not so much a secular space, but a, but a space um, infused with a kind of um, anthropology of becoming like God, but in our through our own power and through our own technology and things like that, right? And just kind of to, to summarize your kind of obser observation. Well, we 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 are prideful beings in our in lots of our life, and we're often prideful without understanding where we come from, where we're going, how things work. We just imagine that we can we can do these things. Uh, you know, we people imagine. You know, I'll give you a simple analogy. In in eighteen ninety, there was what was called the uh, manure crisis, right? When the people in New York realized if they if they if they had that many horses, 
uh, coming along to move things through the city the one, that they absolutely needed, that the manure would be 30 feet deep by 1920. Right? And they were so relieved when, with the invention of the automobile, right? Because now we wouldn't have manure anymore. Well, all that they did was put the manure in the air so we could breathe it in, right? And heat up the earth. So, you know, it's just, a, it's just an example of the kind of hubristic pride that we have in our ability to do things. We think we can solve, you know, problems easily and, uh, you know, we, we don't have to be as responsible for our actions as we probably should be. Yeah. So, thank you, thank you for that, Dr. Gillespie. But in the Islamic world, Dr. Kadavar, this isn't the case in terms of for this kind of anthropology of, um, of maybe of pride, but of, you know, of trying to ascend in that way. I guess, how would you, for instance, two questions. One, um, I guess, respond to Dr. Gillespie's observations and also um, reflections in the Islamic world, but also, number two, um, your reflections on it, is there any purely secular space uh, for the state to operate in, for, or for any part of society to operate in, or will it always be influenced by irreligious, whether it be anthropology, um, or um, even a theology about God or about the highest principle? So, I think there are two fields. First, something that this is the field of natural sciences, and the other field is the field of humanities and social sciences. The rational of these two sciences are not the same. And the big question for the believers, regardless they are Muslim or Christians or <coughs> Jews or anyone else, what is the role of God in these two fields? It means in natural sciences, something like physics, like biology, like uh, neurology, and in the second field, what is the role of God in the history? in the society, in law, and the others. So, in medieval time, we have somehow the same logic in these two fields, among the scholars of that time. Something that we learn from modernity, I think the methodology, the different methodologies that we should have in natural sciences, in humanities and social sciences, in philosophy and theology, they are not the same methodology. Do not use, for example, empiricism is excellent in natural sciences, but if you use it in philosophy, it's positivism. Mm -hmm. If you use it in humanities, I think this is also a little bit problematic. So. I think this is a question of philosophy of religion before question of Islamic theology or Christian theology. What is the role of God? I think in the medieval time, they tried by their understanding, they said something, they wrote something about physics, about astronomy. But today, we understand, no, it's not correct. Written by Plato, Aristotle, Aquinas, Averroes, Avicenna, all of them. Why? Because this is the field of natural sciences. And we cannot rely on medieval philosophers in this field. Natural sciences after Newton, after Einstein, after all of these scholars are deeply different. We cannot rely on them. So because of it, I want to say those who want to read the scriptures, Torah, Gospel, the Quran, they are not scientific books. They were not written for discovering the nature. Their aim was something else. So if, if they wanted to talk with the people of their time, is it possible to say something that we understand today? Was it possible? Today, we know quantum, we know RNA, we know DNA. But on that time, they did not know th these issues. If Moses, Jesus, Muhammad said something in this way, if they know, if they knew this, and said something, they said, what are you saying? Or, for example, evolution. 
maybe we can prove it according to our natural sciences biology today if we go and read Genesis okay is it consistent with this or not I think if it is consistent or it's not this is not, not the job of a scripture the job of a scripture is something else we learn something about God about next life about ethics not about natural sciences that we can understand we can find by our mind by our rationality and the rationality of today is completely different from rationality of 10 centuries ago in natural sciences but how about humanities and social sciences can what is the role of god in the first field natural sciences we can learn many good issues from philosophers not from scientists from philosophers what is the role of god do we have necessary cause in nature or not if the scientist i did not see it in my laboratory okay you did not see it it does not mean it does not exist it does not exist so it means that this is philosophical question existence or non-existence of god both of them are philosophical question it's not scientific question scientific question is limited by the matter physical universe is there any metaphysical cause beyond it or not this is the job of philosophy philosophy of religion not or metaphysics it's not the job of any sciences if a scholar of physics biology said something okay we love you but in your limitation not beyond it you can say in my physical universe in my uh, uh, field of biology this does not exist but you cannot say beyond it there is no metaphysics at all only philosopher can say something in this field so this is big difference in the first field in the second field what is the role of God here okay this is philosophy of history this is something that Ibn Khaldun wrote something according to his understanding seven, seven centuries ago but today we have other philosopher of history or what is the rationale of sociology the changes that happened in different societies anthropology I think we need these modern sciences also this is not something we can learn from scripture okay what should we learn from other scriptures a lot of issues meaning of life I cannot get an answer of this major question through physics or biology I should go and read the scripture who is God what is the attributes of God these are something we can learn through religions what happened in the next life let me know which sciences can tell us what happened in the next life we live in this world for 90 years old less or more but our life will be eternal on that period so this is completely you know there are many many big issues that we learn from our scriptures or from our religion this is not scientific this is not also this is not the job of the job of the scripture is not something like humanities or uh, social sciences if we differentiate between these uh, methodology after that it's so easy that what can we learn from our scriptures or from our traditions um, for me something about God next life ethics rituals these are some things that we can learn from this but the other issues the sciences no I have reason I will refer to my reason not to the scripture if we have something in the books the scriptures it's examples for the people of the early religions on that time they should talk with the people according to their mentality 
So because of it, it's impossible to say something for our time. But in the scriptures, we have some teachings forever. In all of these scriptures, we can find something. Okay, it was only your first question. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for that. Thank, thank you so much for that thorough answer, Dr. Kadavar. And so I'm, I'm sensing that um, in your perspective, modernity has made really a category error between uh, natural sciences and that methodology, and then humanities, and then theology, in, in this other category, and that and with, philosophy, in philosophy as well, and that when it merges, right? So, for example, when um, people, whether it be later on with um, Darwinism, how um, now all of a sudden naturalism becomes kind of the focal lens to view also humans, so that humans are just naturally kind of automatons in that kind of way, influenced by natural sciences to the fullest extent. And so, I guess how uh, our next segment is how this kind of philosophy of modernity trickles down into our liberal institutions in particular and also in our senses of justice and how um, modernity kind of influences both of those. So I guess for, um, for I guess, for you, Dr. Kadavar, on a symposium that you gave with tolerance and diversity within Islam in 2005, you argued that um, freedom of thought and faith is not only beneficial to Islam and the Muslim world, but also mandated by um, the religion as well. And so I guess, can you elucidate, both which, um, within the scope of our talk, why um, for religions in general, but also particularly for Islam, why this freedom of thought is so um, crucial, particularly against um, or maybe in concert with, um, with the liberal and modern understanding of individual rights and, and freedom? That's a big question, but yeah. Yes. So this is, I think, freedom of religion and also freedom of human being in broader field. This is a big question for human in the history. Among the scriptures, maybe the Quran, the scripture of the Muslims, has the clearest defense of freedom of religion, unconditional, unconditional freedom of religion. No compulsion on the case of religion. We do not find this clear statement in other scriptures. So, in my article two decades ago, and now recently in my book, Human Rights and Reformist Islam, a chapter of it is on this issue. And I mentioned seven categories of verses of the Quran in support of freedom of religion. It's not one verse or two verses. We call them liberal verses of the Quran. It's something like more than 100 verses in support of this issue. So, one of them, I recited the translation of it. There is no compulsion, no force in the case of religion. You know, faith is something like love. I cannot force you to love her. Okay, love comes, and sometimes we turn, but you cannot force anyone to love someone else. Faith is exactly something like love. Because of it, and if coming to a religion, converting to a religion is free, okay, converting from religion should be free too. We cannot say it's okay to believe in this religion. But if you want to go out, you will be executed. Okay? It means that there is no freedom of religion at all. So, according to the Quran, we have the reason you are free to come to this religion, you are free to go out of the religion. Another issue that this is so highlighted in the Quran. It's diversity of religions. It means that the Quran accepted that human beings had different traditions and mentioned the name Judaism, Christianity, and something like Sabi, saying the John Baptist, some very close to that. We, it was mentioned, they have their rights and they are the people of the book. We are talking, if we compare with Christian and look at Augustine, 
the, the most distinguished theologian, Christian theologians, in his book, religion is not plural, singular. We do not have religions. We have religion. This is the big difference between Islam and other Abrahamic traditions. By 1960s, Vatican II, it was not accepted by Vatican that we have religions, that salvation is possible out of my church, not out of any church, out of my church. So it means after that, yes, today they accept this, that salvation is possible for non-Christians too. Salvation is possible for Protestants. Salvation is possible for Catholics. That what we have in the Quran, it means if you believe in one God, if you believe in the next life, if you are among the good doers, salvation belongs to you, regardless of your name. You are Muslim, you are Christian, you are Jew, or you are anyone else. I think this is diversity first, religious pluralism second, and also freedom of religion third. So these are something that the Muslims have. But this is in, in the Quran. How about, and also in the tradition of the Prophet, that did Muslim practice it? Sometimes yes, usually no. Why is there another political and social question that happened? There is difference between Islamic theory and Islamic practice. The question that you made it ask me before, what happened to Muslims that sometimes they were in the top and no they are not? It's because of this, because there is a gap between their theory and their practice. If they practice what was in the theory, in the scripture, in the Quran, okay, they have been in the best position that they were before. I'm very summarizing yes. to, to have more time for prophecy. Yes. Th th thank you. Thank you for that um, elucidation and that wonderful answer. And in, in particular, particularly, so there seems to be, taking your reading of the Quran and of Islam, Dr. Um, Kadavar, that both really independently we have, I guess, the theory of liberalism, although, um, or theory of liberalism, I should not say that. I guess the theory of individual rights and of freedom of religion in, in a lot of ways, um, and those kind of three pillars that you've outlined in terms of diversity, pluralism, and then individual respective, I guess, conscience, um, both from, I guess, modernity on the more um, um, intellectual, rational side of like through natural reason, but then also through revelation in the, in the Quran. So, but I guess coming to modernity in the, in the 21st century, in, the, in these thoughts now, there seems to be a conflict between some liberal institutions as formulated in the West and then also being either imposed or being uh, suggested into Western, uh, into um, Middle Eastern and just other uh, Muslim, Muslim majority countries in general. So I guess it um, can be taken to either one of you, but just to um, explain how, for example, when you have different questions about modernity or different questions about liberalism in, um, Muslim countries, why is this tension here? Why is this tension there? If, in theory, both of these um, practices and perspectives can be um, compatible. This is a round of professor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let, let me just re-emphasize something that Professor Kadavar said. It, Islam in its history has been much more tolerant than Christianity. I mean, there's just no question about that. Uh, and you, you see, in when the when the uh, city of what was then called uh, what was then called Constantinople was surrounded and by Muslim armies, the one of the leaders in there said, "Well, you know, I would much rather be ruled by the Sultan than by the Pope, right?" Uh, because they because they knew that the Sultan wasn't going, you know, that they weren't going to insist upon everybody becoming. A, uh, a Muslim, but they certainly knew if, the, if they were ruled by, by the Pope, that the Pope was going to insist on everybody becoming Catholics. And, 
you know, we see the first edict of toleration in Christianity was you know, the Edict of Torda in 1564 in uh, Transylvania, of all places, and you know, there they, they officially tolerated Unitarianism, which was the, the, became the king's religion, uh, Lutheranism, Catholicism, uh, Islam, Judaism, and Orthodox Christianity. And, you know, and it's always been, it was always perplexing to me, why, what, why Transylvania? Why did that happen? Well, the easy answer was, it was under the suzerainty of, the, of Suleiman the Magnificent, the, the, the Ottoman Empire. So, you know, it was only that he was willing to tolerate diversity in a way that the, his, his neighbor, Charles V, who was the head of the Holy Roman Empire, was not, right? So, you know, so there, there is certainly a long history of toleration in, uh, in Islam that would, took a long time to develop in, in Christianity, Locke beginning with, beginning with the Edict of Torda, Locke, a whole long struggle for something like toleration took place, and it was rooted in a notion that number one, the goal of Christianity, of, of Christ in the Gospels was peace and not war, and that we needed a sort of simple definition of what Christianity was, which was, you know, I believe that in Christ, I believe in modeling my life on Christ, et cetera, et cetera, as opposed to all of the creedal concerns that had to do with Trinitarianism, that had to do with, you know, what the specific duties are, uh, of, of Christians were in terms of sacraments, et cetera, et cetera. But that took a long time to develop in, in the West, and uh, that was present for a long time in, in, in Islam. I think one of the things that happened w w with Islam was that, that there were, that, that was colonialism. Right? It just made it difficult for people to sustain their, their Muslim ways of life when, the, the other, when modern Western countries were imposing themselves. Now, they weren't all liberal countries, uh, the, uh, all liberal governments in those countries, so I, I don't know, think I would want to identify it simply as liberalism. It was, it was clearly imperialistic, though, and uh, if you wanted to get ahead, for example, in the British Empire section that was, Pac was most Muslim in Pakistan or Bangladesh, you had to, you know, you had to become more secular, right? And that, you know, it, so it was, it was a, uh, late in life Churchill said, you know, maybe we made a mistake. Maybe we shouldn't have uh, thought of them as having, a, a, you know, something to learn from us. We should have learned something from them. Um, you know, but that was after the, they, had lost, they had lost India and Pakistan and Bangladesh and a whole variety of other countries. Yeah. So, but yeah, th th thank you for that answer, Dr. Gillespie. And so just to elucidate that a little further, uh, in your epilogue, in, in your book, you argued that the, our ignorance of the theological origins of liberalism keep us from understanding why many of our liberal institutions are ill-fitted to the Islamic order of the world. So I guess, can you... Uh, explain what you mean by that, and also can you give maybe some examples of ill-fitting liberal institutions, Ness? and maybe you can distinguish between, I guess, the colonial imposition of these institutions and maybe just like the general kind of way of life of liberal countries. Well, but, but I mean, to go back to something that Professor Kadavar said, we have to look at the different sociological structure. What, what is the structure of the family? What is the structure of the, of the, of the community? Uh, how do you know how do how do people live with one another? What are they used to? I mean, if you had taken if you had if you had transported someone from from a, a much more communitarian society into America today, well, as, as we do when people immigrate, sometimes they feel lost and they there's some you know for them there's something missing. Uh, you know, uh, ha having an extended family makes it a whole lot easier. It makes life a whole lot easier and a whole, and a whole lot dip, more difficult in lots of ways. Right? So, uh, you know, I think that, that that was one of the problems. There's just such sociological differences. I, I think in the long run, there are also, you know, climatological differences that make huge differences. I mean, if you look at the distribution of Muslim peoples around the world, they tend to be in much warmer climates. Uh, they're going to be much more affected by climate change. Uh, you know, than people in North America or, you know, in, in, uh, in England and Europe. 
uh, we worry about it, but those are people that we, you know, we, we you know, that, it, that you could say, we're, we're transporting our heat around the world, but it's really going to affect them, yeah. right? So, you know, uh, and they were, they, you know, we, when Aramco started pumping oil out of Saudi Arabia, they were, they were paying them a pittance for what they were, what they were pumping. So, you know, it was, you can understand why that, that made it difficult for those people. Now, I think within Islam itself, and Professor Kadavar has written very eloquently about this, there's a difference between your reformist Islam, conservative Islam, and, and radical Islam, yeah. right? And, you know, the mistake that people make is, when after, you know, after 9-11, for example, was in thinking that all, you know, that you can simply say all people who are Islamic are radicals, right? I mean, whereas anybody that knew anything about it would say, they're, you're sure, they're, they're radicals of all kinds. They're radical Christians, they're radical Jews. Jews, for sure. There are, you know, there are radicals for all kinds of religions. Uh, even if I could go back to India, I don't think anybody here is from India. My, my daughter-in-law is from India. But the, we have a word, the thug, a thug, right? The thuggy were a, were a cult of Cali, and they would be very friendly to travelers. They would move along with them, and then they would strangle them in the middle of the night. So, you know, there, there are all kinds of... Now, how much of radicalism is rooted in religion? It, it cert, you know, we, I've written about the wars of, so-called wars of religion, right? A quarter, probably killed a quarter to a fifth, a quarter to a third maybe of the European population between um, 1550 and 1700. Okay? It was a, it's just an utter disaster. Now, it was also a time of national consolidation of, our, of, of political forces that moved, but the interaction of those two things was really disastrous. Um, for lots of lots of people that lived in that in in that world, and you know, it was hard to know if people were killing people, be, you know, because they were Protestant or they were Catholic, or whether they were killing people because they wanted their land, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So you know, those 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 efforts are mm -hmm. are are clearly present, and you know, when we invaded Iraq, it was it was hard for people to know what why did we go there? Why did we do that? It's hard for Americans to know that, let alone for, for the people that were there. And, and uh, you know, one of my colleagues thinks George W. Bush was the worst president of all because he killed more people than anybody else. Right? They, we just don't think about that because they were sort of, for us, nameless Muslims who lived in Iraq. Um, thank, thank you for that question, Dr. Uh, sorry, thank you for the, your answer, Dr. Gillespie. So, turning over to you, Dr. Cadavar, do you think that, maybe on a theoretical level, that any, in particular, liberal institutions that you can think of that are incompatible with maybe all forms of Islam, including reformists and the conservative and uh, maybe a more radical Islam, or do you think like all liberal institutions, broadly speaking, can fit um, and be compatible within um, an Islamic framework? Jason, let me ask, what do you mean by liberal institutions? Yeah, so, so I guess this is from everything to democracy in particular, to... Um, Transgender surgery. Can be that as well, okay. or just like the, that radical individualism of wanting to um, make yourself anew. And so in that, in that way, but also um, in that focus on individualism and, and on particular, maybe voting rights can be another thing as well. Um, so Dri driving a car. I, I know yeah. lots of people that shouldn't be driving cars. <laughs> yeah, in America. yeah, at all. So you know, constitutionalism <laughs> could be one thing, right? So there's there's many um, different layers to this. So I guess to to both of you, you can also respond, and then to Dr. Cavar um, in general. Yeah. This question has two sides. First side is liberalism. Second side is Islam. Professor Golapsi mentioned that we have different types of Islam, not only Islam, but also Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism. We have, among all of these traditions, we have conservatives that are in majority in all of these traditions. We have reformists, and we have fundamentalists or radicals. Mm -hmm. Among the Buddhists, you can find. Among the Hindus, you can find. Among these Abrahamic traditions, also you can find. And the, the answer, 
of their, their answers to the question of compatibility with modernity, all of them are the same, also they are from different traditions. Reformist Jew, Reformist Muslim, Reformist Christian have the same answer to, to the question of uh, compatibility with modernity. Conservative Jew, conservative Christian, conservative Muslim, the same answer, regardless they have different traditions. But I want to add something about liberalism. I think a good question of Professor Golopsi that what do you mean by liberal institution? I want to say what do you mean by liberalism itself? So do not think that we have one type of liberalism. Go and read the entry of liberalism in encyclopedia, online Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. The first line of it is, we have liberalisms, different types of liberalism. Not only political liber liberalism, we do not have the same interpretation of political liberalism, but also we have at least two major categories in liberalism, political liberalism, comprehensive liberalism. Which of these two do you mean? What's the difference between these two? Okay. Political liberalism, it means something like individualism, freedom, all of the issues in the political framework. If you ask me, what do you think that is Islam, at least reform Islam, mm -hmm. compatible with political liberalism? I strongly say yes. There is no difficulty in this issue. The same as it also reformist Christian, reformist Jew, and the others. It's only about political liberalism. But how about comprehensive liberalism? What is comprehensive liberalism? We should ask the most distinguished philosopher of liberalism, John Rawls. And he said, OK. Comprehensive liberalism is an ideology. It's not political, it's not something like political liberalism. What does it mean? It means comprehensive liberalism has its system of values, system of ethics. And it's comprehensive, it means everything that you want to ask, okay, liberalism will answer. There is no role for any tradition. It's not for Muslims. If you believe in comprehensive uh, liberalism, there is no role for Christians too, for Jews, for anyone else, because this is the key that can open all of the locks. This is only the air, nothing else. It means that comprehensive liberalism I think, according to John Rawls, especially second Rawls, not the first Rawls, mm. because he criticized his first uh, writing of liberalism, and he wanted to say, in my political liberalism, that I also believe in it, I myself. Anyone, except fundamentalists, <laughs> except fundamentalists, anyone, conservative, reformist, regardless of their tradition, atheist, believer, they can work together in politics. This is something that we can learn from him. If liberalism is this, I agree with it. Mm. I think Professor Golapsi also agrees with it, as uh, I read his book. There is no difficulty with it. But if, you believe, if in your questions you are asking us about comprehensive liberalism, I'm sure I do not agree with it. I think it is not correct, and no one can work under comprehensive liberalism. We should, I think, this is ambiguity. Sometimes they use, they in, their intention is comprehensive uh, liberalism, but they ask us about uh, political liberalism. We should distinguish these two and do not mix them with each other. Liberalism is not something that is the answer to any questions. It's the answer to only political questions, nothing else. We need traditions. 
We need Abrahamic traditions for our religious or philosophical questions. But in polit politics, yes, I'm a liberal. But only in politics, <laughs> not in other issues. In the other issues, I'm a Muslim, you are a Christian, he's a Jew, or he's a Buddhist, she's a Hindu, and the other traditions. And we can live together. This is diversity and their liberal pluralism. I hope mm. that you get the answer. Yes, that is a, that is a, thank you for that excellent answer. Let me, let yeah. me add you, just, just, yeah. one, just one explanatory character to that. It, it's certainly true that the people we think of as the founders of liberalism, John Locke and, and John Stuart Mill and others, didn't believe that we should have something like what we think of as absolute or cultural liberalism, right? Which is to say, any kind that Locke distinguishes between what he calls liberty and license, right? And license is acting freely, but not doing something that is rational or is inter that is good for your preservation or the preservation of others, right? Uh, <clears throat> And you know, in that sense, you know, there are just, and this is of course a huge question for us today, where we see conflicts of rights between in questions of abortions and questions of homosexuality and questions of uh, plural marriage, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all those are all difficult questions for all religions because religions have spoken very definitively about those things. In, 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 in their in scriptural texts. So it's very difficult for conservatives, conservative Christians, Jews, or, or Muslims to agree to some of those things and, and for understandable reasons, right? The, uh, now, you know, that, that the, we live in a, we, we, all we, we have customs, all of us do. In, in, and when we don't have customs, we really, we, are, we float, a, a sort of on our on our on our on our own and and really become depressed and upset. I mean, we we need to have customary ways of doing things, and customs are going to vary from place to place and time to time. And and sometimes customs are are um, uh, are in place for good reasons, and and those you know in the future those reasons may change, right? Uh, you know, almost all societies, for example, have uh, incest taboos, right? And they, they take a whole variety of different forms. If you go to Australia and talk to the Aborigines, you'll find that they have a system that is almost incomprehensible to someone who, who, who isn't brought up in it. But they all pretty much amount to the same thing. You shouldn't marry your first cousins, right? I mean, and, and why? Because we don't survive. I mean, the human race wouldn't survive if that were a, an ordinary practice. And you see that in lots of the European monarchies where, you know, it leads to imbecility, it leads to extended jaws, it leads to all kinds of, of, of birth defects. So, you know, there's, there are reasons that, that, that custom has discovered that are very useful for our survival. And that whether, you know, we, don't, we can't scientifically write out, a, a, here's the reason you shouldn't marry the, your cousin. But there are interesting cases, for example, there was a very, well, a, a less famous, but a, a, a case in law in the United States where two twins, male and female, were separated at birth. One went with the mother, one went with the father. They met when they were 18. They fell in love. They wanted to get married, right? And what do you think happened? The court forcibly separated them, right? Yes. Even though the boy had had a vasectomy, so there wouldn't be a problem with this. Mm -hmm. And you know, and and when I tell this to my students, a lot of them will say, "Well, I don't understand. Why did they do this? They were in love with one another, et cetera, et cetera." And I said, "Okay, well, let me tell you the story a little bit of a different way. You know, same story, separated at birth, and when the girl is 18, she meets her father, falls in love." The father has a vasectomy. Okay, yes, exactly. I see the, the nausea erupting in the back of the room there. Yes, but you begin to see that how deeply these, custom, these customs shape us and shape our, our moral attitudes with respect to the world, often for very good reasons, right? So, um, you know, the idea that somehow we can 
you know, we can choose to be, remake ourselves in all kinds of ways. And, and trust me, with CRISPR, for those of you who are interested in biology, we're going to be able to remake human beings in all kinds of ways. Right? And if you ask yourself, if there, were, if there were a drug that could make your children smarter, would you give them that drug? Right? I mean, we already, you guys, parents have already paid a fortune to have you do special programs, tests, et cetera, et cetera. If it was just easier to take a drug, would you take that? And, and, and well, maybe people would say, no, no, I wouldn't do that. I want, my, I want the, the kid that I have. But then your kid's the dummy in class. I mean, uh, so there are all kinds of pressures that, 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 and I think this is, I would disagree a little bit. I think modern science doesn't tell us anything about this, but it changes the world in, to make things possible that previously were not possible and it opens up possibilities for us that are sometimes hard to resist, but that often undermine uh, you know, the way in which we live together. Thank you very much for that question. And so this will be kind of the final wrap up question to try to, because I know everyone wants to probably ask a question. And so this is really about the future and what to do now after we've gone through this journey together of elucidating both I mean, that was an excellent distinction between kind of political liberalism and then kind of comprehensive liberalism. And so in many of these countries going forward in the, in the um, not too distant future, in 2050, um, the population of both Muslims and Christians will grow exponentially in Africa in particular, where they will live side by side. And, and one case in point is Nigeria, for example, which is um, happening right now. And so how should we go forward in terms of for both Christians, Muslims, in terms of with um, liberalism and modernity? And so, um, just you know, this is that, um, should the goal be to play within the respective traditions and try to, I guess, double down on these traditions in a kind of harmonious way? Or should we try to um, suffuse it with liberalism in either a political context or in a um, comprehensive liberalism context? And, and how should we disentangle uh, political liberalism and also comprehensive liberalism? I think that's also a big question. So I guess, and, and we can wrap up here. Um, and thank you guys for, for taking the time. So uh, final, final thoughts and words, yeah. Well, so I would say the, the few, I, I have my doubts about the future. Uh, it, you know, I sometimes ask myself if we're leaving the world a better place than the world we inherited. And, and uh, I used to feel pretty good about the fact that you guys didn't have to do duck and cover drills in case of nuclear war. But of course, that may go away as well. Uh, but, you know, that was before we thought about global warming and a whole variety of things. But also, I just think the demographic, we're having demographic collapse around the world, right? People move into urban areas. How, how many of you are single, how many of you are single children? So only children, yeah. The average number of children in America is about 1.8 per couple. That's not replacement. In, in, in Korea, it's 0.58, I think. It's way down. China is, China's is, is in terrible shape in that respect. So, and with global warming, there are going to be lots of movement of population. So, you, you mentioned Nigeria. Nigeria is a tolerable place now, but in 20 years, it may not be so tolerable. And, and some of my best students have come from Nigeria because their parents were able to move and come here. So, I think there's going to be a big, there's going to be a mixing of all kind, and especially from people from the Islamic world, because it's going to become the hottest place on earth. So I think those people are going to move, and and we and we really need we're going to need to have people uh, to su sustain our social welfare system. So I, you know, it's uh, uh, going forward. I think there are lots of problems that I'm really happy that you guys are going to solve, uh, and. In my, in my, uh, as I pass into the seer, that you will, you will find ways to, to keep funding my, uh, my, 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 you know, my continued existence. In any case. Thank you, um, Dr. Cadabar. Okay, I have two points here. First, I want to distinguish between real politics and politics. This is in theory and in practice. What we have in theory, John Locke, Hobbes, all of them are great, Tocqueville, and I learned many things from each of them. But in the case of real politics, 
you can see what happened in the Middle East today. And this is something that I think this is dirty, this is dark, this is far from any ethical, moral values. It's also far from political liberalism too. Mm -hmm. So I hope that in 2050, we will have a better real politic. Every day that I wake up and read the news, I become sad, upset. And what's happening? So this is number one. And also, I have a critical position about, as I mentioned, Muslims in practice on one side and liberal societies on the other side, both. First, I start with the Muslims. So we have more than 50 Muslim majority countries. Unfortunately, none of them have liberal democracy. Or say, except one or two. It means that they do not have good time for their people. I do not talk about comprehensive liberalism. I'm talking about liberal, political liberalism. But on the other side, we have in, in the West that we are here. So we have many rights. We have liberal institution that you mentioned. Also, sometimes I said, OK, we are OK. Our situation is OK. One of my people, one of my friends, people of color, say, do you think that we have a good situation, egalitarian situation? Be careful. I understand also, also he, he was a professor too. The people of color, it means that they have some problem on this case here in US. But we have at least some portion of human rights, some types of democracy here in Europe and in US. But do we deal in the same way out of our country when we want to our foreign policy? The priority of our foreign policy is preserving democracy and human rights out of US. Then, for example, our president traveled to Saudi Arabia, traveled to Israel, traveled to other countries. Do they preserve this issue? I remember this. Professor Kolopsi may know better than me. West and the rest. Not West and East, West and the rest. It means that we have this liberal institution much better than the other countries in the West. But we do not deal in the same way. I, I mean only about democracy and human rights, nothing more. About the others. I think they are not priorities of our foreign policy. In each of these cases, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Israel, in Palestine, in all of these countries that you find here. So, so our situation today, I do not satisfy. I hope that in 2050, it will be better mm -hmm. for both Muslim countries that I mentioned, more political liberalism, and for the West, better decision for the rest. The problem is this. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you for this wonderful conversation to the both of you. So let's give them a round of applause. For <laughs> now we will open it up to questions. If anyone has a question um, that they'll like to ask. Yeah. And we can maybe pass the mic around. I'm trying to, you know, or. Yeah. Your mic. Yeah, my mic, actually. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, anyone? Anyone? Anyone got a question? Anyone got a question? If not, then well, that's good. Oh. All right. 
Okay. <laughs> you can, you can just speak up. Or, or you need microphone. Do you need the mic? Actually, yeah. Mic would come be good. Here. You can't come here. You can, you can, you can come. You can take it up. Here. Take it. Take it. Go. You can be the moderator. Yeah. Yeah. Let me. Hi, thank you so much for this beautiful uh, and uh, intriguing conversation. It was lovely to listen to you. I was wondering, I mean, you covered all sorts of political ideologies, but now from a Marxist point of view, the ways in which you engaged with uh, liberalism, I was wondering how, like, uh, you know, from a Marxist or socialist theoretical perspective, um, the critique of liberalism would look like. I'm thinking of books in the early 2000s published by, for instance, by someone like Samir Amin, Samir Amin who is not based in a liberal uh, institution, especially higher in, in higher education, either in Europe or the Anglosphere, but was working his whole life very consciously in on the African continent and published in 2004 a book called The Liberal Virus, looking at the ways in which basically uh, liberalization political and economic liberalization has been imposed through institution building um, across the world, right? A, a form of contemporary manifestation of imperialism. So I was just wondering how you would kind of, uh, how your discussion of liberalism would interface with this sort of Marxist or socialist uh, critique, which does not take liberalization for granted, but actually questions it, and also the liberal approach to human rights. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think what you're, I, I mean, look, the, the question of Marxism in general is, uh, it, it covers, a, it is as broad as, as liberalism, right, when, in, in terms of what it, what it means. Right, there are varieties of Marxism of, of all kind. But I take it that your, your, your question refers to the critique of what, what some Marxist theorists call neoliberalism. And neoliberalism is really, uh, it, and people think of it as uh, um, a reflection of globalization, which is to say that the transform, you know, the, the, the extension of supply chains, the, the growth of industry in those areas, that is developed on a capitalist model of one kind or another and that uh, ch changes the, the s nature of societies in those countries that, you know, Nike has shoes that are made in probably in Vietnam today still and that that changes the way in which people in Vietnam live. Now, some people who live in Vietnam may want to have jobs in Nike plants, but it, it leads to changes in property ownership. It leads to, it undermines lots of cultural forms. And that, 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 I think that's, my own view is that's coming to an end because I think globalization is coming to an end. Uh, the pandemic started that, the, 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 the failure of American, you know, the, uh, the lack of American will to, to de defend the, the supply, the, the sea, sea lanes and the supply chains. You know, that, that, that's coming to an end. We're gonna, America is clearly re-industrializing bringing lots of those uh, industries home. But it, what it effectively did was to drive wage labor down around the, uh, you know, to, to the lowest place that you could find it. So people in, in industrialized countries and uh, around the world, you know, it would, labor would move from, companies would move to place to place where they could find the cheapest labor. And that is obviously incredibly disruptive. The, the deindustrialization of the Midwest, for example, the destruction of our, our heavy steel industry, for example, is just a reflection of what, what that's all about. Um, you know, I, I think that that will be mitigated somewhat, but you know, it's, uh, it, you know, it's certainly um, one, of the, one of the things that, uh, drives our American politics as well as politics around the world. So do, 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 can, can liberal, can liberal, I mean, and probably the preeminent example of, of the way in which that's connected to 
uh, imperialism was it was Allende, the, you know, the CIA involvement in overthrowing the Allende government in Chile, um, you know, which was a liberally elected government in lots of ways. So it wasn't just wasn't the kind of liberalism that people wanted because it was it and you, and you see in some some South American countries movements towards regimes that are more friendly to their uh, to the to the poor than to the rich but even in some of those countries like Venezuela they you know they they have a hard time making it happen yeah i think that you know that they have two types of political theory first liberal theories and second marxist theories so both of them classical liberal and modern liberal or no liberal and we have classical Marxist and no Marxist. So I think criticism of Marxists to liberal, liberal theory are so uh, uh, important for us. And priority of liberal theory is freedom and liberty. Priority of Marxist theory to politics is justice. We need both. And this criticism of both sides to each other made a lot of good ground for us. For example, you mentioned Samir Amin and also in among the no Marxists, Herbert Marcuse. So we can find many good issues among them, both sides. I myself follow not only liberal theory, but also no Marxist theory like Marcuse and after him. So and I I think that I encourage you to follow both of them to find freedom of justice, not one of them. I think we have that gentleman. Hello, question. thank you. Um, so I have a question regarding the very definite distinction that's been, that seems to have been set between your, the Theor theological and theoretical and more abstract forms of these philosophies and, well, of these religions and what is more attributable to soci sociological, political, and um, honestly, geographical uh, changes. And it, I, I've, I've gotten the impression that we seem to be drawing like a very distinct line and I want to ask, like, what, why would we do that? Well, like, beyond like the very logical, re like, yes, we do that because they're different. But what is the purpose of um, staying on one side of that, if that's making any sense? Like, uh, what, what, what is the purpose? Of, like, what, what can you accomplish by staying on one side of that line that is drawn? If I understand correctly your good question. So I emphasize a lot on methodology and especially philosophy and also philosophy of religion because uh, this panel is about something between Islam and modernity and as you saw we have a lot of questions from the moderator and also from you it's they are related to philosophy of religion and before that to philosophy. So in my class of course of religion and science, I found that most of the problems that I, we have, it's because of methodology. And in the first sessions, I try to emphasize on this issue that what is, what is philosophical question? What is physical question? What is biological question? What is the domain of natural sciences? What is the domain of social sciences? What is the domain of humanities? This is the responsibility of the discipline to determine the domain of each of these disciplines. I think this is the job of philosophy. Because of it, not philosophy, I do not mean metaphysics. This is exactly we learn from philosophy about the uh, 
domains, limitations, restrictions of each of these disciplines. This is something I encourage you to take some courses on this to philosophy and ask what is the restriction of physics? What is the restriction of biology? This is a major point for us. Before that, okay, I know some, some a scholar of physics that there is no metaphysic. Okay. This is according, if you accept this methodology, okay, I'm sorry, you are not a scholar of this point, this domain. We need here metaphysics, we need philosophy, and so on. So this is something that many accept and also some disagree with me, that differentiation between different methodologies. I hope that you get your point. <laughs> I would say that this is a kind of Aristotelian notion that each science has its own beginning point, own starting point and that they're separate. That is something that is, becomes, that is problematic for many contemporaries because they think that there's simply a system that should explain everything, right? Yes. Now whether that's possible, that's another question. But let me just give you a concrete example to make the difference between theology and sociology maybe a little bit more clearer. I was at my uncle's funeral t 10 years ago, maybe, and the, uh, he, the, the minister was giving a wonderful speech to the grandchildren about how someday they would see their, you know, w with the resurrection, they would see their uncle not as an old man, but as a strong, and so, you know, so after, there was a little luncheon afterwards, and I went up to him to talk to him and said, you know, you, know, you talked about the resurrection and I, I wonder how many of your parishioners really believe in the resurrection of the body and that we're all going to be on a new earth. And, and he said, well, they all repeat the creed. And I said, well, <laughs> I can repeat the creed too. That doesn't mean you believe this. And he said, well, you know, maybe 5%, right? They think people are going to go to heaven. I mean, they have this vision of, you know, from television, they're going to go to heaven and there's going to be clouds and they're going to play harps and, you know. It, but they don't, you know, they've never, so sociologically, there's one religion plays one role, but in, an, in another, or, and then I asked him later, how many of your people really believe in the Trinity? And he, you know, he, he was, he came up with about the same number, maybe even less. Uh, and then I said, how many understand it? And he, then that was zero, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, so I, you know, I think what, what, what people do in theology often deals with issues that are more theoretical in that sense and less rooted in the sociology. Now there is, within our school of religion, for example, there's a real concern with, with, uh, with sociological elements as well. Uh, thank you so much for this enriching conversation. Uh, I have a question regarding the decline of religiosity, especially in North America, and what um, you think that the impact of such decline will be on our generation specifically. So uh, just to give some context, uh, Duke conducts a freshman survey every year, and for as long as I can remember, the freshman data clearly show that more than 50% of freshmen self-identify as either agnostic or atheist. Um, and from what I can tell, that's a sharp contrast from um, like our previous generation of college um, attendance, uh, re re religious affiliation. So I was wondering, um, despite the fact that so many of our um, like legal foundations, political institutions are rooted in um, theological origins, as you have argued in your book, um, and despite the fact that like the Muslim pop like population is going to experience exponential growth, as you have alluded to over the next few decades, how do we kind of mitigate the fact that it seems to me there is still like a strong decline, a decrease in religious affiliation among the young, perhaps less so in the Muslim population, I'm less sure about that, but definitely in America where like Christians um, have experienced such decline. Um, so yeah, curious to hear your thoughts on that. 
When I first wrote a, a paper on religion and cons conservatism in the Anglo-American democracies in 1985, I think, uh, I looked at all of these surveys, and at that point, about 95% of Americans believed in God, 60% believed in, a, in an actual devil, uh, and it's now, I think now it's about 80%, down to about 80% in most of the surveys, and, um, and, and some of that has to do with immigration, uh, some of that has to do with, uh, you know, it, it, it used to be the case that 35% believed in evolution, now it's up to 55%. So that, you know, it may just have something to do with that. Um, I, I, I think predictions about the future when it comes to religion are always incredibly difficult because it, in early America, which I've been studying recently, there were on very many, most people were secular until the Great Awakening, and then the Second Great Awakening, and, and you know, suddenly lots of people found religion. And in, in part, and I, this goes back to something that Professor Kadavar said, the, uh, you know, if you want to, if you ask yourself, what is the meaning of your life, right, what does it come from? It, you know, it, it's, it, it, we, we know that from, a, from a, a psychological standpoint, thinking that you have some purpose that exceeds your own life, some higher purpose, is something that's extraordinarily valuable for people being successful. So, you know, whether that comes from religion or s something close to religion, the sacredness of nature for, you know, people in the, in the e ecology movement, the sacredness of the human person, uh, you know, but I think it requires I th so I think people that characterize themselves as not religious often are religious in the sense that they, they still believe in many of the religious values, they just don't, they don't go to church, right? And even then, when, you know, the data that from 1985 when I was, when I was looking at, they've gone back to analyze that and, and people then said, I go to church every, at least three weeks out of four. And the data all from, from church records shows at most, it was one out of three, or one, you know, maybe more likely one out of five times they were going to church. So, you know, people on surveys, you can't, you know, they're, not, they're pretty untrustworthy. Uh, you know, and, and when the Duke students say that, that doesn't surprise me, right? Uh, you know, I, I, I remember the social survey at one year asked about how many people have had sex, and it was like, the men were like four out of five said, oh yes, well, you know, I, I've had sex, and the women were one out of five. And you just, you thought, okay, there are either some women out there that are really promiscuous, <laughs> or they're lying. And I, I went with they're lying. Right. <laughs> well, on, on that note, uh, uh, you know, I think it's time for Caroline to put her dad to bed. Uh, but thank you all uh, for, uh, uh, for, for great questions, and uh, please join me in thanking uh, for Jason and uh, Professor Skadovar and Gillespie for just a really wonderful conversation. Thank you.